Join the conversation. Join the conversation. You're with Cape Talk. 25 minutes to 10 o'clock. Let's keep it standing in for Kino Kamis. Uh, it is after 9.30 on a Friday. That's when we invite the naked scientist, Dr. Chris Smith, to answer your weird and wonderful science-based questions. Plenty of uh, people all of a sudden interested in virology and uh, issues with uh, uh, respiratory disease, particularly with uh, news of the coronavirus. I, I just want to know, Doctor, uh, there have been concerns about different strains about of coronavirus. Firstly, why is it called coronavirus? Corona, if I remember my Latin, uh, it's got to do with a, a crown or a halo. Wh- 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 where does the name come from? I'm really impressed that you remember your Latin because you did it probably as long ago as I did. And um, yes, I had to think hard, but the word corona does mean crown. And if you look at these viruses down a microscope, and in fact, they're so small that you need an electron microscope to see them. Each virus particle, which resembles a spiky football, is about 100 nanometers across. That's about one ten thousandth of a millimeter per virus particle. And this is a big family of viruses. They're pretty common. Some of those viruses infect uniquely humans, others infect normally uniquely animals. And birds often catch them, humans can catch them, but other animals, more exotic animals, including bats, possibly even snakes, also have coronaviruses. And we divide them up into a series of subfamilies, what are called alpha, beta and gamma coronaviruses. And the excitement around this new virus emerging in Wuhan City from China and now spreading around the world, this falls into the beta coronavirus family. And this is really a grouping based on the structure of the virus genome. And we can learn an enormous amount about a virus by reading its DNA code. And in this case, it's RNA, a related molecule to DNA, but it's still the genetic code. And when you read that genetic information, in the same way that I can learn a lot about who my parents are by reading my DNA, if you read the the genetic code of of one of these viruses, you can infer where it came from. And that's the initial steps that scientists have taken to work out that this is some kind of bat virus. And we think that it's jumped from a bat, possibly via an intermediate host, another animal, which has then helped it to spread into people. And it's now spreading between people. And the numbers are quite prodigious. I mean, we're, we're probably close to 8,000 cases just in China that we know of now of this. And the Chinese authorities are keeping tabs on nearly 90,000 people who've been in contact with those 8,000 people uh, in order to find out who may or may not have caught it and then who does or doesn't need to isolate for a while while they get rid of it. This does... This is- this does bring us uh, or bring back some memories of of uh, sort of epidemic based movies uh, i'm thinking of for example the movie outbreak with with dustin hoffman could we go back and and sort of find a a patient zero of uh, where this uh, where this uh, infection may have started is that what uh, what sort of uh, virological investigators go and do in a case of an epidemic outbreak like this Yeah, the amazing thing is that we effectively have got patient zero here because back in December, it was the 1st of December that the first cases of this began to surface and a very small cohort, maybe 30 or 40 people presented with this and it was from talking to those people that the authorities were able to pin the blame on that particular wildlife seafood market and it was that that was the common origin in all the people. They were all connected by that market which is what put people onto the idea this is some kind of jump of a new virus from an animal which you find in a market into a person and then investigating the market they found in a very large number of samples taken from this market this virus in in their samples and then when they sequenced the genetic information of the virus that put them on to yes the suspicions are confirmed it looks like it's it's jumped in from a bat and and also what the nature of the virus was so yes this is an unusual circumstance because we have actually got the smoking gun and the scene of the crime here the big question is going to be well why has this happened what what actually happened to make it jump from the presumed bat into the into the people why has this suddenly happened now and is the virus changing as it moves through the human population if so at what sort of rate and in what way is it changing is it becoming more or less virulent our suspicion is it will become less less lethal as it goes through the population because it will adapt to make it spread very well but but probably make us less ill that's the natural uh, trend that viruses tend to follow when they jump from one species into a new one I'm, I'm quite 
interested in, in the fact of how a, a, an animal-based uh, virus can transfer into a, a, a human. Is this because somewhere along the line, somewhere humans and certain types of animals share some sort of genetic makeup in that way, whereas a, a human will be as a, 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 a comfortable or accommodating host for an animal-based virus? Viruses are absolutely tiny. They are the ultimate parasite. They're so small that they're effectively just an infectious bag of genes. And they need to invade a cell and hijack it to turn it into a virus factory using all the machinery in the cell to make more viruses. And in order to do that, they have to specialise in order to target usually one particular group of cells and often one particular group of cells in one particular group of animals because it is such a specialist process. That's not to say, though, that if you take a virus and offer it the cells of a very similar animal, so if you take say a mammal like a bat and a mammal like a human, the virus could work up to a point in both sorts of cells but it might not work as well. And the virus will have adapted to work very well in a bat cell for example and this will include working in ways that enable it to out or sidestep the bat immune system. And equally the bat will have evolved to accommodate working with this virus. But when you put that into a new host like a human because the genetic code works in anything because even even a bacterial gene the code is the same in a bacterium as it is in one of our cells you can move genes between different organisms and they work so this means that the virus genetic code can be understood by our cells but in some cases the tweaks and the evolution of the virus is not well adapted to how our human cells work so it tends to cause more intense disease and that's why you, you tend to see when you get these jumps um, in some cases very high mortality take Ebola as a good example bats don't die of Ebola in the same way that we very quickly die of Ebola because the virus is not adapted to us and we're not adapted to it but over time that can change and in a, in a natural evolution of an infection in a population the viruses generally change in order to become less lethal and better able to spread and persist in that population. And that's probably what we'll see with something like this, unless we can jump in and stamp it out. We're speaking to Dr. Chris Smith. He's the Naked Scientist. We're taking your questions. Anything science-related, 021-446-0567, or drop us a WhatsApp or a voice note, 0725671567. One message that's come through on our WhatsApp line, Dr. Smith, is about face masks. Person's asking, how effective are face masks? And um, what face mask would you recommend? I've seen uh, pictures of friends walking around China that look like they wouldn't be out of place in the carpenter's workshop looks like he was busy working with a <laughs> with a with a with a belt sand and that's how big his his mask was but but what do masks actually work it depends on the mask. The ones we use in the hospital, which have been what's called fit tested, these are very high-end masks. They have very small pore sizes that, that actually are capable of filtering out particles as tiny as viruses, and they make a very good seal around the nose and the mouth, and when combined with eye protection, because your eyes can be infected, and even if your eyes can't be infected, because tears wash into your nose, anything that lands on your eyes can end up in your nose as well. Therefore, you have to take all that into account. The vast majority of these masks that people are using are no good whatsoever. Yes, they would be fine to stop a bit of sawdust or if you're laying new insulation in your roof space, they're not going to be any good at all against viruses. So I said to one person last week, I would save your money. I'd go and spend the same amount of money or less on on a pint of beer and I'd sit in the bar and drink that because it will protect you equivalently well against the virus. You'll have a lot more fun doing it. You might even save some money. <laughs> 021 446 0567. We're taking your questions for the naked scientist, Dr. Chris Smith. But I think it's a bit more of a tongue in cheek question that we received here. It says, it asks, if setting off nuclear weapons creates nuclear winters, why don't we just set off a few nukes to offset a global, to offset global warming? Well, we've been down that path before, uh, not with nukes, but with other enormous catastrophic explosions that have changed the climate. We reported last week on a story that was published in the journal Nature, where scientists dated the world's oldest meteor crater. It's in Australia, in Western Australia, uh, the Yarraburra uh, 
meteor crater and it's 2.229 billion years old and because they were able to date it very precisely from various crystals which are now in the ground around the crater and you, you because you know where the crystals are and you know how old the rocks are they're with and the ratio of various radioactive chemicals in there you can get a very precise age you can then ask well what was the climate doing at the time and the evidence was that this thing changed the climate for half a about i think it was half a million years there was a very profound change in the earth's weather and climate patterns so in other words you put something that or you ha you have something that produces enormous amounts of dust and gas and puts water vapor into the atmosphere and it has very long term change change effects on the climate so doing doing a similar thing with a nuclear bomb apart from poisoning people with radioactivity could have catastrophic climate effects and they wouldn't necessarily be uh, good climate changes and they wouldn't necessarily be easy to reverse so if we got it wrong and we you know we don't understand how this works so we'd be taking a huge risk it's much better prevention is much better than cure it's better not to get ourselves into big climate trouble in the first place which is why people are trying to say look let's let's throw the oil tanker into reverse while we've still got some time before we hit the beach one of our listeners wanting a response to, I think it was a question last week, about how much pressure is needed uh, to turn a lump of coal into a diamond. I know it's been yeah, done. Still it's working been done. on this. Yeah, um, I, I am. I am still working on this because I've got a friend of mine who's a material scientist onto the case, and we haven't got the answer to this yet. But I promise I am working on it, and I will have the answer for you <laughs> very, very soon. But yeah, no, I've got. I've sent it to a friend of mine who's a material scientist who is on the case. Which ra which raises the questions: Would synthetically created diamonds, which would be exactly the same, you know, m m mineral properties as as a natural f uh, form diamond, would it? cost more or less on on the open market that would be a very very good thing to understand whether uh we should just be making our, our own diamonds synthetically and whether they'd cost the same oh you can and there's a very big industry around making artificial diamond because diamond has some very exciting chemical and material properties in terms of its thermal conductivity electrical uh, behaviors etc and so you can go and buy a huge diamond if you want to that's been made artificially the usual way we make them is with a process called chemical vapor deposition you feed in a source of carbon usually in something like methane because that's the simplest form you have carbon and four hydrogen atoms and using uh, a clever usually catalytic process the the carbon atoms are built up onto a surface you have a seed crystal and then you deposit the carbon atoms with this vapor deposition and you can build enormous diamonds now the thing is these are industrial diamonds they don't have any of the beauty um, you could you could cut them and so on they have the same properties as, as diamond but they don't have the same natural weirdness that a natural diamond does there are various inclusions there are trace elements and other things that are in diamonds that we find naturally which are there by mistake and it's the mistakes that make them beautiful and very valuable and you can't get that with an artificial diamond so it would be a, a, a poor facsimile of of anything and if you tried to marry your sweetheart with one she would object <laughs> Well, I have a theory that uh, that diamonds are all a scam and was created by the advertising companies, but uh, <laughs> that's a conversation for another day. But Rodney has called in Wetton with a question for uh, Dr. Chris. Dr. So Chris, sorry, maybe going back a step, but the virus in China, I understand again from person to person, but what happens if it's not taken up by a person? What about the virus in the air? Yes, this is something that people consider very carefully when they're thinking about the control of viruses because it depends on the virus, how long it can persist in the environment. Some viruses are more fragile than others. Some are extremely hardy and they will hang around for a really long time. A good example of a virus that can hang around for a really long time is the norovirus. Sorry if anyone's having breakfast. This is the one that causes diarrhea and vomiting. And people produce billions of these virus particles in every milliliter that goes upwards and downwards out of your body. So I think the statistic is that every centimetre cubed of, of stuff that comes out of you when you've got noroviruses, there's enough virus in there to infect the entire world population. Now, these viruses are really tough, and when they land on a surface, if you touch that surface, you can get them on your skin, and if you lick your fingers, rub your eyes and whatever, the infectious dose is so small, you could infect yourself. That's why you need to clean surfaces with bleach and chlorine and so on. This coronavirus that's in Wuhan City and now spreading around the world is an enveloped virus. It's got a, an oily bag around the outside of the virus. Now that means it's a bit more vulnerable than other viruses like Noro that don't have that. So it doesn't last for so long. And, and a good equivalent is say, well, how long does the flu 
which is a similar sort of virus last in the environment. People have done experiments on this, and it's anything between a couple of days and a couple of weeks, depending upon what the virus lands on and where it lands, because other things, uh, including drying, dry air and ultraviolet exposure from the sunshine all deactivate these viruses and that's why they're more common in winter actually because there's less uv in the sunlight so they don't persist so long in the in the in the air and on surfaces because the uv busts apart the virus so the answer is it's going to depend on where the virus has landed what sort of surface it's landed on and the environment in which that surface is and all those factors have to be taken into account but it will range between hours to days on average, for this thing remaining viable on a surface that you could touch that and pick it up. And, of course, it bobs around in the air for a while as well, for hours before it lands on a surface. And if you breathe those particles in, you could catch it that way too. Thanks so much, Rodney, for your question. Kerry on the WhatsApp line is asking, I keep reading about people being sensitive to Wi-Fi and 5G and cell phone towers causing them health issues. Uh, This is a perennial question, Dr. Chris, uh, that has somewhat, there's been inconclusive proof that cell phone towers do cause any harm. But but from your perspective, uh, your answer to Kerry's question? There's no evidence at the moment that that actually supports a a clinical relationship. The the problem is that when a person says, well, I'm sensitive to this, it can become what we call confirmation bias. The person says, I think this is happening, and then they find all the right examples of them feeling unwell when there's some Wi-Fi or some cell phones around, and then they convince themselves that that's right. It's not actually ever been subject to a proper blind trial, as far as I know, where a person doesn't know if they're really being exposed or not to these sources of radiation to measure their symptoms. I think if it were, we would be very hard pushed to show any obvious physiological effects. For people who think that this is affecting them, obviously it's very real and their concerns have to be taken seriously. But I don't think we've got any biochemical or physiological evidence at the moment that, that there's any real effect. And so that's going to be the subject of a lot more scrutiny because we know exactly how much of this information, sorry, how much of this radiation we're pumping out and where from. We know who's exposed to it and in what sort of dose. So people are actually following the relationship between input to people and health outcomes to see if there's any obvious change and at the moment they haven't spotted one but is there a correlation between somewhat of the the white noise of uh, uh, an older tv and the faint ringing that you get in your ears i have once upon a time gotten a headache from the slight buzz from i guess was the white noise from a television and a faint ring in my ear could that then be a correlation to to the physical effects of, of some of the the, the not emissions but some of the the output from from maybe older technology well maybe the the more likely thing is that you found the noise from the tv annoying and it caused you stress and this caused you to tense all your muscles up around your head and neck and that gave you a tension headache i mean that's the the more likely thing um but who knows i mean at the moment as i say you can't argue with objective data so what we're doing at the moment is just collecting enormous amounts of data to look for who is being exposed to what and in what sorts of amounts and at what sorts of times and marrying it up to to health outcomes. And if we start to see a relationship, which we haven't yet, but that's not to say that we haven't looked hard enough and we need to keep looking so people are, when we get to that stage, we'll know. And uh, then we can do something about it if we need to. Someone raising uh, the the um, the first or, or the most high resolution uh, pictures of the sun that was released earlier this week, and they're asking why does the sun look like caramelized popcorn in this picture? <laughs> I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, what, what, can you can you describe the uh, caramelized popcorn? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. It's it's popcorn, but it's sort of glazed with a uh, with a uh, with caramel. That's what we have here back at home in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've seen these no, pictures. I've, I've not look, seen that picture. But, but uh, the, the, what, what what thing does the sun look like if we're not, you know, looking at it directly with our eyes? We have seen some some pictures uh, of of the sun, but what does the sun actually look like? Yeah, I think what they they might be referring to is there was a a piece of research published last week in the journal Science, and it was by um, Dr. Fleischmann. And what they were doing was using microwave detectors on the Earth's surface to study the sun's magnetic field, because when you get a changing magnetic field, then you get a changing electrical field, and this can produce signals which we can pick up. And they were able to explain why 
or at least part of the explanation for, for the bizarre magnetic behaviour of the Sun. Because just like the Earth does, the Sun has its own magnetic field. And this magnetic field, unlike our magnetic field, which is very stable and static, and you could you could plot where the Earth's magnetic field lines are, and you could come back tomorrow and you'd see almost the same pattern. The Sun has a very strange magnetic behaviour which changes, and it rises and falls and undulates, and there are some patches on the Sun's surface where it will build up and build up and become incredibly intense and powerful, and then suddenly it will collapse. And when it collapses, you get things like a solar flare, and you convert all of that magnetic flux into a sudden unleashing of energy which throws material off the surface of the Sun, and this creates hot spots and cold spots on the sun's surface and if you look at it thermally you will see something that looks like a blob of pop popcorn with hot <laughs> bits and cold bits which are the caramelized bits i think and and so that understanding this new understanding gives us a lot more insights into how the sun is working but also making predictions about what the sun might do to us because periodically the sun has these convulsions when it flings off all this material at very high energy into space and if we're in the firing line mm. these particles which are charged particles which are going past us at say one and a half kilometers an hour they can do quite a lot of damage to our infrastructure satellites they can also affect infrastructure down on the ground so being able to predict when that's going to happen we know it takes a period of time between them leaving the sun and arriving here on earth we've got warning so if we understand how they're formed and when they're formed we can do something about it to shut down critical systems move satellites into lower orbits temporarily etc so it, it was a pretty important paper Another question on the impact of um, of our gadgets on our well-being. I think it's A who's asking, why can I hear the annoying piercing sound from an electric pest detector? Yeah, well, of course, when you're young, you can hear sounds which are of a higher frequency than when you're older. So younger children can hear up to about 20 kilohertz, 20,000 cycles a second of sound waves, whereas most adults stop hearing at about 15 and there are various reasons why that happens and why your ears become less sensitive so younger people generally can hear those higher frequency sounds that are used to repel animals the cats rodents etc because they don't like those sounds because they can hear them routinely not the children the pests i mean and so the children happen to pick the sounds up because they have more sensitive ears it may be that the person referring to who's, who's referring to this is, is in that category mm. there are also devices including electronic devices laser printers routers and so on you have in your house which they they have uh, in them an oscillator which is producing the signals and making the chips work and they tend to produce a high frequency buzzing as well which is just perceptible i've heard and of some people find that quite irritating. I've heard of some malls that have put in some of these gadgets at the entrance of, of you know, some of these stores to, to keep you know, young mall rats away because they're irritated by this high-frequency sound. Yeah, they they do the same thing. It was um, first outed and touted as a, as a way of doing this to stop to disperse crowds about 20 years ago, and it is used routinely. You put these things there, and young people are sensitive to them, and they will disperse away from the source because they they find it's annoying, and they they often don't even know why it's annoying. They just know there's an irritating sound there, so they go away. It's a one way to say, stay off of my lawn, Dr. Chris Smith, the naked scientist. <laughs> Thanks so much.